It's possible that some word of me may have come down to you, though even this is doubtful, since a name, insignificant and obscure, will scarcely penetrate far in either time or space. Petrarch, you're being far too modest and pessimistic. Your name is not insignificant or obscure, and it has penetrated far in time and space. Hello and welcome. I'm Ross King, and I'd like to talk to you about one of my favorite characters in history, one of the most fascinating and one of the most important, Francesco Petrarca, a.k.a. Petrarch. And besides discovering Petrarch in the context of Renaissance discoveries, I'd like to look at Petrarch's discovery of Rome. Where to begin with Petrarch? He was a poet, a scholar, a book collector, philosopher, diplomat, traveler, mountain climber, political agitator, a gardener, a lover, a father with a problem child son, and a manuscript hunter through the dust and must of monastery libraries. He even has a town in northern Italy named after him. His historical importance is beyond question. A professor at the University of Rome with the wonderful name Amadeo Quandam has called him the founder of modern European culture. Back in the middle of the 19th century, a French writer called him the first modern man. 150 years later, Petrarch is no less modern to us. Any of Petrarch's many incarnations as a love poet, perhaps especially because his lyric poetry dedicated to his beloved Laura is probably what he's most known for today. Any one of these things would make for a deserving and fascinating exploration. Today, however, I want to look at him as a historian and prophet. Historians study the past, prophets look to the future, but in Petrarch, these two things come together because he believed that we can know the future, even create the future by studying history and coming to terms with the past and that we can make the precious legacy of the past come to life in the present. And Petrarch was no false prophet. The future that he prophesied, that he longed for, did come into existence, and we today are the beneficiaries of that. So who was Petrarch? He was born into a Florentine family in 1304. This is the time in Florence of the poet Dante and the painter Giotto, although Dante was exiled from Florence in 1302, and so, as it happens, also in 1302, was Petrarch's father, who was a friend of Dante's. Petrarch's father was a notary, i.e. a lawyer, named Pietro di Parenzo di Garzo. He was known as Ser Petraco, Ser being an honorific, rather like Esquire used by attorneys in the United States. In 1302, soon after he got married, Petraco was accused of legal misdeeds. Wrongly, it was all a stitch up by his political enemies, but he was given the choice of either paying a fine of 1,000 lira, which is probably double his annual salary, or having his right hand chopped off. Neither option appealed to him, funnily enough, and he fled to Arezzo, 50 miles southeast of Florence, and here, in July 1304, his eldest son, Francesco, was born. So Petrarch was effectively born in exile, and in many ways he remained an exile throughout his life, at home everywhere and nowhere. In about 1311, the family moved farther away from Florence as his father took the family, Petrarch had a younger brother by this time, to the south of France, to Carpentras, near Avignon, to which the papacy had moved from Rome in 1309, and where Sir Petraco looked for and found work at the papal court. Young Petrarch began studies in law, first at Montpellier and then from 1320 at the prestigious University of Bologna. But his great love was not legal texts, but classical culture, the literature of ancient Rome, especially authors such as Cicero and Virgil. In fact, as a boy, he kept a collection of Latin classics under his bed, when his father discovered them, he angrily tossed them into the fire, like heretical books, as Pe Petrarch later recalled. However, seeing his son so distraught, Petrarch Sr. quickly plucked two books out of the fire, 
one by Virgil, the other by Cicero, and handed them to his son. Petrarch would devote much of the rest of his life to salvaging what remained of the classics, trying to recover and resuscitate the world of the ancient Romans that he believed, for good reason, was being lost and forgotten. So Petrarch did not become a lawyer or notary like his father. Instead, he became a poet, a kind of itinerant man of letters, and what we might call a public intellectual. He was also a perpetual wanderer. He traveled the cities of Europe from Naples to Prague, on board ships, on river boats, and on foot. One scholar has cataloged him in 83 different cities and towns across Europe. The most important place for him of all these 83 cities was Rome, which he visited for the first time in 1337. Friends had tried to dissuade him from going. He idolized ancient Rome so much that they thought it could never, in its present fallen state, live up to his expectations. Now, that was actually a pretty realistic fear, because for Petrarch, no society in history had come close to equaling that of ancient Rome in terms of the greatness of its political and military leadership, the extent of its empire, and the quality of its writers and thinkers. What else then is all of history, he once asked, if not the praise of Rome? Rome at the height of the empire, say around 100 AD, had a population of as many as a million people. That had shrunk by Petrarch's time to about 30,000. The entire population of Rome could have fit inside the Colosseum if the Colosseum wasn't a crumbling ruin scavenged for building materials and taken over as a housing complex by various gruesome and warring families. So the grandeur that was Rome had well and truly passed. And to repeat, the seat of the papacy was no longer in Rome at this time because in 1309 it had decamped to Avignon. No one was more sensitive to the terrible decline of Rome than Petrarch. In fact, he looked at the history of the previous thousand plus years quite differently from anyone else, emphasizing loss and decay since the fall of the Roman Empire in the West in 476 AD. In the traditional Christian view, history was divided into two distinct periods, a period of darkness and error before the birth of Christ, i.e. the pagan world, followed by a period of light and truth that came with the advent of Christianity and that continued, most people believed, up to the present day, and that would culminate with the return of Christ to earth. History was therefore on an upward swing. Petrarch turned this view of history on its head. For him, the ancient world of Rome was a period of glory and light, while the previous thousand years had been a long downward slide into darkness. And when he asked himself when exactly this decline began, he had his answer. It was when the name of Christ was celebrated in Rome and adored by the Roman emperors. That is after 312 AD and the gradual Christianization of the empire under Constantine and his successors. Now, it's important to note that Petrarch was a devout and believing Christian, but Christianity, he maintained, had produced unfortunate effects on culture, on political leadership, and also on the Latin language, something about which he was very persnickety, and something about which, luckily, I talk about with great clarity and fascinating detail in my video on the Renaissance discovery of Latin. Now today, historians have a much more sophisticated and nuanced understanding than Petrarch did of the causes and consequences of the fall of the empire, all of which are still debated. And in many respects, let's face it, Petrarch was just plain wrong or biased in his interpretation. For example, one of the things he claims is that the empire was weakened because of the rule of foreign emperors. He writes that strangers of Spanish and African extraction stole the scepter and the glory of the empire founded by us, i.e. by the Romans. He knew that was rubbish because some of the greatest emperors were of Spanish or African extraction. Trajan and Hadrian were both from Spain, while Septimius Severus was born in present-day Libya. 
still, the glory was undeniably gone. And it's not surprising that it's to Petrarch that we often assign the coinage of the phrase, the Dark Ages, for the centuries after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. Once again, parenthetically, a period that most historians, most medievalists today, would not say was as unremittingly gloomy as Petrarch believed. But Petrarch certainly saw himself and his contemporaries as living through the fag end of a dire historical period. My fate is to live amid varied and confusing storms, he wrote. In fact, to cut Petrarch some slack, he did live in what the historian Barbara Tuchman has called the calamitous 14th century, or what another historian has called a bad time for humanity. He lived, for example, through the papacy abandoning Rome for Avignon, the Hundred Years' War between England and France, through multiple famines and insurrections across Europe, and of course, through the Black Death of 1348 to 50, that killed perhaps half the population of Europe, including his beloved Laura. Petrarch himself admitted that he considered putting off his much anticipated trip to Rome, lest my enthusiasm should be quenched by the aspect of this ruined city. However, Rome did live up to his expectations, and it provided him with a kind of formula or recipe for the regeneration of politics and culture and a return to a period of glory and light. When Petrarch arrived in Rome, he wrote to a friend, proudly dating his letter, the capital, Rome, the Ides of March, 1337. In this letter, he described how he was crushed by the miracle of the city's greatness and the weight of his own amazement. What amazed him was not the present day Romans living in their hovels and taking their drinking water from the polluted Tiber, and not the warring feudal barons who would occasionally emerge from their fortified palaces to knock seven bells out of each other in violent and bloody street confrontations. But rather, of course, Petrarch was amazed by the magnificent ruins of ancient Rome, these spectacular remnants of what seemed to be the race of giants who had perished a thousand years earlier. The Rome of 1337 may have been a mess, but Petrarch had a plan to bring the grandeur back, to make Rome great again, and to make the world great again, and that was through galvanizing the corpse of ancient Rome and bringing it back to life. The proudest moment in Petrarch's life came in April 1341, when he returned to Rome to be crowned poet laureate, as Virgil and Horace had been many centuries earlier. Think of a cross between the Nobel Prize for Literature and an honorary degree at a university convocation. He received a citation that called him a great poet and historian. This is an important point. He is crowned a historian as well as a poet. He got a crown of laurels, Roman citizenship, and the right to talk about poetry wherever, whenever, and with whomever he wanted. He then delivered an oration, and what a speech it was. It offers a pivot point of the sort that historians used to like to find to separate one age from another. In fact, about 50 years ago, a historian wrote that this speech illuminates more clearly than any other document the transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. This historian called it, in fact, the first manifesto of the Renaissance. Historians today are a little bit more skeptical of these stark dividing lines, but the work is no less remarkable for that, and it does indeed mark a crucial moment in cultural history. In his speech, Petrarch discussed the role of the poet slash historian. Studying and knowing the past and writing about it in the way that Virgil, for example, had done for Rome in the Aeneid, was the secret to a better present and a glorious future. The poet historian was therefore the hope for the future, someone who could mediate between the past and the present and help 
restore the grandeur that was Rome to this depleted and divided city. He regarded the poet and historian as being at the forefront of and crucial to a cultural renewal. Now we have the question of how seriously the people of Rome took Petrarch. The answer is probably not very. He lamented in his speech that people did not actually like poets these days. And in his speech, he continually, continually insists that he will be brief, which maybe speaks to some foot shuffling restlessness on the part of his audience. However, Petrarch took extremely seriously his task as the leader of this cultural renewal. In a letter written around the same time, i.e. in 1341, he described his walks around the ruins of Rome, and he wrote, who can doubt that Rome would rise up again if only she began to know herself. So Petrarch began a project to teach Romans to know themselves, to teach them how great Rome had once been and how it could regain its greatness and be reborn if people were taught and practiced the ancient virtues. Petrarch was disgusted with the incompetence and corruption of most politicians and church leaders in his own time, and he hoped that by telling stories of the ancient Roman heroes, he might inspire his greedy and ignorant contemporaries to imitate their example. It was for this reason that he began writing Lives of Illustrious Men, a collection of some two dozen biographies of ancient Romans that he selected because of their value for teaching moral principles. He wanted to place the example of virtuous and heroic ancient Romans before our eyes. In my book, he wrote, nothing is found except what leads to virtues or to the contraries of virtues. For unless I'm mistaken, this is the profitable goal for the historian to point out to the readers those things that are to be followed and those that are to be avoided. For Petrarch, perhaps the greatest of the Romans was Scipio Africanus, the Roman general who defeated Hannibal and his 80 war elephants in 202 BC at the Battle of Zama in what is now Tunisia. There's something quite sweet about the gentle scholarly Petrarch idolizing this brilliant Roman hero who defeated Hannibal on his own turf. Scipio became the subject of what Petrarch considered his own greatest work, an epic poem written in Latin called Africa, which is about Scipio Africanus. At the very end of the poem, he expresses a hope for the future, a hope that lies in a return to the golden age of the past. A better age will surely follow. The sleep of forgetfulness will not last forever. When the darkness has been dispersed, our grandsons will walk again in the pure radiance of the past. Petrarch did not believe that he would live to see this radiance, but true to his prophecy, the past was recaptured and cherished by what we might call the grandsons of Petrarch, men such as the humanists as they became known, who flourished in 15th century Italy, especially in Florence. They carried on Petrarch's project of studying history and searching for answers. They believed that a better world could be shaped through the creative imitation of tried and trusted ancient models. In other words, how to rule a city, how to frame its laws, how to be a good citizen, give a speech, fight a battle, educate children, be a good friend, lead a virtuous life, and even how to have fun. These were the men, in short, who helped create the set of ideas and cultural practices that would later become known as the Renaissance. But that is another story. Thank you so much for watching. Please follow my other videos, subscribe to my channel, and even should you so wish, read some of my books, especially on the topic of Petrarch's grandchildren, my newest one, The Bookseller of Florence, available from your favorite bookshop. Meanwhile, I leave you with the words of the bookseller of Florence himself, the great Vespasiano da Bistici. All evil is born from ignorance, yet writers have illuminated the world, chasing away the darkness.